This is a battle we've never faced in my lifetime. I want to tell you about 416 of the most amazing people. Every day I get to see their skill, professionalism, and dedication. Their commitment to protect and improve the health of everyone in Hillsborough County. The last two months, they've been on the front line of a battle with a very dangerous enemy, COVID-19. And they've risen to the challenge in the most amazing, heroic way. Everyone has contributed, sacrificing their personal life, which they put on hold. They're making a difference for everyone they help. And every day I get stopped and told just how amazing they are. I'm proud and blessed to work with them, my second family. A lot of things have been canceled, a lot of things have been postponed, but definitely not kindness. And we want to spread the kindness in our community and know that our first responders are still here for you. And thank you for staying at home for us and we are here for you. So today we are here to surprise a little boy who is turning nine. He just moved to the county with his family and he's very quiet, very shy, but has an affinity for fire trucks. And so what better way to welcome him to Hillsborough County and also maybe celebrate a little bit of his birthday by bringing one of our very own fire engines and a rescue to do a little drive-by, especially during this time. We hear someone's having a birthday here. Is someone having a birthday here? Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hillsboro County leaders and local health experts want to get a clearer picture on how many residents may currently have the COVID-19 coronavirus. To help those efforts, testing criteria has been expanded. Now, any resident wishing to be tested for COVID-19 can call 813-272-5900 weekdays between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. to request an appointment. You do not need to be experiencing COVID-19 symptoms to receive a test, but the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has added six new symptoms to its existing list. COVID-19 symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell. If you develop any emergency warning signs for COVID-19, such as trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion or inability to get up after sleeping, or bluish lips or face, you should seek medical attention immediately. Call 911 if you have a medical emergency. Notify the operator that you have or think you might have COVID-19. If possible, put on a cloth face covering before medical help arrives. We encourage you to visit hcflgov.net slash stay safe for up-to-date information. Hello, I'm WWE Superstar Titus O'Neil, and today I'm coming to you as a neighbor. You owe it to yourself and those you love to get tested now. Get the care you need and protect your family. Hillsborough County is offering free coronavirus testing and no health insurance is needed. It costs you nothing to get tested. Call 813-272-5900 and have a reservation made today. Visit hcflgov.net slash stay safe for more information. Share this with a neighbor and let's come together as a community and keep fighting to get through this. Together we will come back stronger. God bless. If the COVID-19 coronavirus affects one of us, it affects all of us. It does not discriminate based on race or ethnicity. We are in this together. And when we work together, we are stronger as a community. 
Each person that has accurate and timely information about COVID-19 not only helps him or herself, but it's helping the entire county. That's why Hillsborough County needs your input in the Anonymous Stay Safe Survey. Your feedback will help Hillsborough County provide you and your loved ones with necessary information and resources to get through this COVID-19 pandemic together. It takes just a few minutes. I've taken the survey and now I challenge you to be a community player. Text STAY SAFE to 73224 or visit hcflgov.net forward slash STAY SAFE INPUT to take the survey. Hillsborough County has teamed up with the Department of Health and other public health and safety agencies to address any impacts the virus may have on our local community. To help prevent the spread of the coronavirus, here are a few tips you should know. Practice proper hand washing by using soap and water and wash for at least 20 seconds. Use alcohol-based hand sanitizer if you cannot wash. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth cough and sneeze into a tissue and throw it away. Clean high touch surfaces frequently. Some examples include doorknobs, credit and debit cards, cell phones, keyboard and mouse devices, and toilet handles. Stay home if you're feeling ill. If you have any flu-like symptoms, avoid contact with the public. Avoid sharing personal items in spaces with those close to you. Seek medical care early if you're feeling sick. Symptoms of the coronavirus can include fever, coughing, and shortness of breath. Seek medical care if you develop these symptoms or if you've been traveling or have been in close contact with a person who has traveled from an area with an ongoing spread of COVID-19. We encourage you to visit hcflgov.net slash stay safe for up-to-date information and tips. So due to our closures of all of our congregate dining centers and senior centers because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have 26 different locations that we're still providing meal services for. Although today is one of our 10 grab-and-go locations. The grab-and-go locations were established at the locations where seniors live in our senior high rises, senior apartment complexes, and for that we work with our food vendor and we're able to literally bring frozen meals to our seniors and then we're delivering 14 frozen meals to our seniors every other week so we make sure that they continue to receive the nutritional meal that they would have if they were still attending one of our congregate dining centers. The meals are wonderful. To me, they're restaurant quality. There's a wonderful variety. It's quite enjoyable. We're used to coming downstairs, having lunch every day. And most of us have given up our cars, so we don't have a car. We don't have the bus to take us to the store. But it would be worse if we had to put together meals ourselves with what we had. To know that the county is taking good care of us and bringing these frozen meals to us, this is very much appreciated. The county takes care of the seniors and we are eternally grateful. We're very grateful. With this pandemic that we are all experiencing, often seniors are a forgotten population. So for our department to continue to stay connected to our seniors, it is crucial for their mental, spiritual and emotional health and also we are providing a nutritional value. We're making sure that they are still receiving a nutritional meal and the feedback that we continue to receive from our seniors is thank you, thank you, thank you. You are saving me from self-isolation and, and just going into a state of depression. 
Hillsborough County has opened a majority of its conservation parks, trails, and nature preserves to give residents additional options for recreation and exercise. While parks can provide an escape and excitement, county leaders are urging residents to take precautions to protect themselves. To help stop the spread of COVID-19 while in public places, use common sense. Stay home and avoid parks if you're feeling sick. Practice social distancing, avoid groups or gatherings larger than 10, and stay at least six feet from others while exercising. In addition to social distancing, Hillsborough County leaders continue to urge residents to wear cloth face coverings when in community settings. Bring your own water. Though parks are opening, many amenities will remain closed. Prepare for your visit by packing necessary items like hand sanitizer, and it's a good idea to bring your own disinfectant wipes to wipe down any public surfaces before touching or when touching public equipment. But remember, don't flush them after using. Residents who do not abide by the social distancing requirements or listen to instructions from county staff while enjoying the parks will be asked to leave the property. We encourage you to visit hcflgov.com dot net slash stay safe for up-to-date information. This is a battle we've never faced in my lifetime. I want to tell you about 416 of the most amazing people. Every day I get to see their skill, professionalism, and dedication. Their commitment to protect and improve the health of everyone in Hillsborough County. The last two months, they've been on the front line of a battle with a very dangerous enemy, COVID-19. And they've risen to the challenge in the most amazing, heroic way. Everyone has contributed, sacrificing their personal life, which they put on hold, they're making a difference for everyone they help. And every day I get stopped and told just how amazing they are. I'm proud and blessed to work with them, my second family. A lot of things have been canceled, a lot of things have been postponed, but definitely not kindness. And we want to spread the kindness in our community and know that our first responders are still here for you. And thank you for staying at home for us and we are here for you. So today we are here to surprise a little boy who is turning nine. He just moved to the county with his family and he's very quiet, very shy, but has an affinity for fire trucks. And so what better way to welcome him to Hillsborough County and also maybe celebrate a little bit of his birthday by bringing one of our very own fire engines and a rescue to do a little drive-by, especially during this time. We hear someone's having a birthday here. Is someone having a birthday here? Happy birthday, Mary Jane. Happy birthday, Mary Jane. Isn't that Stand by. Yes. Terry. Commissioner Miller, uh, Terry McElroy, Director of Communications. We just had to resend the invitation to Mayor Lott. He should be on in just a minute. Okay. Thank you, sir. Let's wait a minute, Mr. Brewer. Understood. Stand by for a stream.
and three. One. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the emergency policy group meeting to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? <laughs> Miller? Here. Overman? Here. Merman? Here. Lot? He's still trying to get on. Kastik? Here. Roth? Here. Chronister? Nicely? Here. Merrill? Here. Thank you. Have a quorum. Okay. We're now moving to public comment. We set aside 20 minutes for public comment. Each speaker will have two minutes to speak. Our first speaker is Jeffrey Ziosis. Yes. Ziosis. Hello. Yes. yes. You're welcome. You recognize her. Go ahead. Are you there? Go ahead, okay. Go ahead, my sir. name is Jeffrey Ziosis. Uh, I am the owner of Bay City Tattoo. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Ziosis. I am the owner of Bay City Tattoo in Tampa. I called in uh, last Thursday to this meeting and asked if the tattoo shops could reopen uh, since the governor had said that nail salons, hair salons, and barber shops and gyms could reopen. Um, I was referred to the county attorney, and the county attorney told me that the governor had closed uh, tattoo shops and nails and hair salons, so he'd be the one to have to reopen them. Um, but I found that that is not the case, that this committee is actually who closed those specifically when on March 25th, there was a vote of 8-0 to zero that ordered a countywide safer at home order, specifically naming hair salons, barber shops, and tattoo parlors. So my question is, if they had the, if you had the power to close us, and our industry, it would stand to reason that you could then reopen us or at least possibly contact the governor's office on our behalf in order to help us get back open safely. The governor of Mississippi this week has allowed tattoo shops to open with guidelines, which I've included in here, which are very similar to those of the governor of Mississippi. And I'm asking for the help of this committee to undo what was done on March 25th so that we can get back to work. I've been 20 years of doing tattoos. I'm in danger of losing my shop now because we can't get back to work. And our guidelines for this are far superior to any other industry that's out there, including restaurants, gyms, bars, barbed bar shops. Uh, and the guidelines that I've added to this, which I included in the notes when I signed up for this meeting, um, I would like to go over to someone. So I'm asking for your help um, to straighten the situation out and get us back to work. <sighs> Okay, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Janice Ura. Yes, hello, sir. My name is Janice Ura. Yes. I'm a small business owner in Hillsborough County for the past 19 years. We have been safely able to operate during this pandemic. Can anyone on the committee refer to me as an employer regarding labor laws? I have an employee for the past five weeks. He just does not want to work. He is in fear of the virus. But legally, how long do I have to keep his position open for? Um, Ma'am, I'm going to ask you to leave your, your name and number with uh, one of the staff members and 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 have one of the the employee, uh, one of the county attorneys that deal with employment may be able to answer your question, refer you to someone to answer that question. Thank you okay? so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. Chris Ann Hall. The Florida Constitution states in Article 2, Section 3, the powers of the state government shall be divided into legislative, executive, and judicial branches. No person belonging to one branch shall exercise any power appertaining to either of the other branches unless expressly provided herein. Article 3, Section 1 says the legislative power of the state shall be vested in the legislature of the state of Florida. There is no provision expressly provided in the Florida Constitution to allow any other branch of government in Florida to write laws. 
an order that has the same legal force and effect of a law, an order that can seize property, punish people with fines in jail, or force compel innocent, healthy people to be confined to their homes is simply a law unconstitutionally made as contrary to the Constitution of the state of Florida. It is simply legislation without representation. Article 11 expressly lists the ways that the Florida Constitution can be amended. Emergency circumstances is not on that list. Pandemic is not on that list, and mere legislation is not on that list. It is constitutionally impermissible for the legislature to authorize the governor, administrative agents, committees, or groups to unilaterally compel 21.5 million people of Florida to stay out of public areas, close their businesses, and face imprisonment if they do not comply. The people of the state of Florida must become better educated on the Florida Constitution and the proper limits of their government. And those in Florida government who took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the state of Florida must become more dedicated to the promises they've made to the people. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last speaker I have on record. Uh, Am I right, Mr. McElroy? Yes, sir, Commissioner Miller. All right, thank you very much. We now move on to emergency management update. Doctor, I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, um, Mr. Dudley. Good afternoon. afternoon. We continue to support uh, Raymond James, Lee Davis, South Shore, and Plant City uh, community collection sites. We have a total of 6,032 kits on hand. Total tests since beginning the operation is over 15,000 now. Test conducted last week as of close of business on May 15th, uh, we conducted 3,754 collections. As of close of business uh, last Friday, we had 4,186 appointments scheduled. Uh, Also, as of last Friday, we have 2,652 appointments scheduled for this week. On to logistics, Um, we've had an increase um, for all PPE and distribution as of last week. Um, uh, We also received 12,000 surgical masks uh, donated uh, with an increase in masks on hand from donations. And we also have zero guests in quarantine, 23 guests in the isolation site. This concludes my update. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Dudley. I don't see any questions. Uh, so thank you very much for your report. We appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Holt, public health update. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Doug Holt, uh, Florida Department of Health Hillsborough County. Uh, to make Today, my report will be um, limited as we are continuing to move towards this uh, weekly report that will be on their epi data and our public health capabilities. Uh, testing, uh, we continue to average approximately 1,000 results returning each day. We've now tested 2.7% of our population, which is up from 1.7% a week ago. Uh, our long-term uh, care facilities remain our focus. We have um, tested, eight, there have been 18 long-term care facilities tested over the last thir- three weeks. Uh, This does include all that we have arranged testing for, uh, but also those that we have been informed by the facility that has tested on their own. This total is approximately 2,300 tests. Uh, Long-term care facilities, uh, uh, we have 30 that we are working uh, with uh, that have had identified at least one uh, case. totaling of 302 cases. Uh, Again, this represents approximately 20% of our total number of cases as reported to date. Um, I would note that uh, we have had 33 deaths associated with long-term care facilities, but it is very important that to note that the overall percentage of cases that were in a long-term care facility that we've identified, the deaths associated with them is about 10%. Um, This is still too high, but is significantly less 
than some of the comparisons where we've seen across the country where up to 30 percent of residents that are infected with COVID-19 have died. Uh, this continues to reflect, I think, the long-term care facilities efforts uh, uh, to avoid and to handle COVID-19, their acceptance of testings, and the proactive transfer of residents to hospitals in order to monitor these patients, these very vulnerable patients, through that initial one to two period where they are at greatest risk of deterioration. Um, also note that um, with the leadership of Mr. Merrill, um, we are working towards um, identifying and arranging a with a long-term care facility uh, that would become a step down that would allow these residents to transition from the hospital to a place where they could continue monitoring to ensure that they are fully recovered before they would then be returned to their long-term care home. Uh, this has great benefits both um, in offsetting or reducing the demand placed on our hospitals, but I think more importantly, this is a, a better location for our patients uh, to receive their continued care. Contact tracing, uh, we have adequate resources based on the number of cases we are currently reporting, but continue to be able to surge if necessary. Um, the, re the number of cases that we have uh, identified to date uh, as of this morning is 1,656. That's an increase of 125 from Thursday. Um, 302 of these cases, as mentioned, or 20% are associated with our long-term care facilities. Um, we've had 55 reported deaths of Hillsborough County residents. Uh, this is an increase of 11 from the report uh, on Thursday. Uh, all of all but one of these individuals has been over the age of 55. Our 14-day trajectory of cases uh, remains flat. Um, and I've also, Mr. Wagner will provide a glimpse of uh, regular reports that we provide, which uh, have separated out the long-term care facilities, which represent about 40% 40, 40 of our cases. Um, the impact of cases on in long-term care facilities or uh, have direct effect on both the hospital care systems and, of course, um, the, the uh, outcomes of our most vulnerable patients. Those cases that are in the non-associated long-term care facility are those that we're watching for community-wide transmission and the surge. Um, the percentage of positive results uh, remains um, um, also flat over the last two weeks. Um, but uh, again, um, as we've described, we're going to look examine this where we separate out our long-term care, which has disproportionately been uh, focused for testing and have found cases. And I think we'll find that the overall percent of positivity over the last 14 days is around 2% compared with approximately 10% of those that are being tested in long-term care facilities. Um, with that, I will conclude my report and ask Mr. Wagner to, to review his slides, please. Mr. Wagner, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kevin Wagner, Business Analyst, Healthcare Services Department. Uh, this will be a quick, quick report, luckily, this mirroring what Dr. Holt just outlined for the ABG members. Regarding two week increments of looking at trend data, the previous two weeks, essentially the end of April, beginning of May, there were 366 total cases. 42% or 154 were located in the long term care facility versus the general population, which was 212. So again, a much smaller account in the general population when we're backing out the long-term care facilities. Moving forward to the current two-week period of surveillance, again, 
It's a 40% clip in the long-term care facility, about 147 individuals, 224 in the general population, 60% for a total of 371 cases in the current two-week surveillance trajectory. So again, the long-term care facilities do take a significant portion of the positive cases as reported currently. Again, this is the other slide that I have today, quite quite quick presentation. I'll speak to the table at the bottom. Again, the current two-week positive, positive cases were 371 out of 18,000 tests completed or reported 2% positive percentage compared to the general population of 1.34% when we look at that population specifically. And then on the long-term care facility on the two week, current two week, 147 positive cases out of only 1,300 tests, a 10% positive ratio of results of those reported cases. So again, the long-term care facility is disproportionately higher when compared to the general population. And that's all, I'll stop there. Okay, uh, questions, uh, Mayor Ross, you recognize. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Wagner, I do have a question. Um, we've heard a lot throughout this whole crisis about the, the asymptomatic people or the people who are infected with the virus but never get sick and probably in most cases never even know they have the virus, but they can carry it to other people, which has obviously been a big reason why we've done a lot of the things that we've done. So at the beginning of this, we were testing sick people, people who had exposures, but now for well, a month, give or take, we've been testing healthy people or anybody who wants to be tested. So since we begin testing healthy people, how many people have we discovered who are the who are the asymptomatic people, the people who have never gotten sick but have tested positive? How many of those people have we found? That information I, I do not have, uh, Mayor Ross. Uh, I defer to Dr. Holt for any answer, but on the information presented, I, I don't have a breakout of that asymptomatic versus the sick of your question, respectfully, sir. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sir. Holt, can you speak to that at all? Y yes, sir. I, I cannot speak to the exact number. Uh, our ep this part of the contact tracing, so every case we identify, we um, um, we we ask those those specific questions. Um, in the general population, outside of the long term care facility, uh, the majority of the cases that we are identifying do report symptoms. Uh, in fact, it's very unusual for someone to to have volunteered to undergo the nasal swab unless they have some uh, po uh, some. Uh, symptoms uh, that, that are positive. So in other words, uh, there may be other people who are tested that are asymptomatic, but we are not finding those. The ones we are identifying positive in, in the outside of the long-term care facility, we are identifying um, those that are positive have report symptoms, some mild, but certainly all report some illness and concern that they were infected. The long-term care is, I don't have the exact number, but because we are doing some very proactive testing, uh, we have found uh, on occasion um, some facilities where surprisingly we identified people that we would not have thought going in had a positive, uh, had, were symptomatic. Uh, these facilities did have a case in the facility, so it, it's not surprising that we found occasionally some positives um, that are asymptomatic in that area. Uh, those that facilities to date that we have a test, it tested that have not had any case just for a point in time, uh, almost across the board, we have not found a positive case. So I, I think the answer to your question is we haven't really found a lot of people uh, in the general public that report of the positives were asymptomatic. And I'll stop there. Okay, just a, just a quick follow-up to make sure I understand correctly. So, is is the 
reason we're not finding these people because they're not presenting for testing even though it's available or is it that we're testing the people and they're just not showing positive i'm still a little confused not not talking about the long-term care facilities so much i'm talking about how many healthy people are showing up at the testing sites just and they just want to know if they've been exposed and then are they just not showing up is that what you're saying well, yeah, I guess, and I apologize, uh, it is, I know, I guess I would say on the back end, the front end uh, with the hospitals all, and all the public testing sites that are being uh, um, uh, run through uh, Mr. Dudley and team, um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are some portion of those people that are choosing to come to get tested because they feel fine, uh, but want to know, not because they feel, that just want to know, but they feel fine. What you're asking was how many positive cases we identified that were asymptomatic. So right. my answer was working from somebody who we know is positive and asking them if they have felt fine. And that is, is something we really haven't seen outside the long-term care. I'll stop there. Thank you, doctor. Okay, Dr. Houghton, Mr. Wagner, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, County Attorney Update, Ms. Beck. Yes, this is Christine Beck, the County Attorney. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and EPG board members. I've been asked to provide a brief update regarding Governor DeSantis's order number 20-123 which is part of your backup. And this order was signed on May 14th and is effective today. Um, the order further modifies the governor's order number 20-112. With regard to restaurants, um, restaurants must now limit their occupancy to 50% of their seating capacity. So this is up from, from 25%. And that is provided that social distancing measures are adopted or that there's appropriate partitioning in place. The bar counters must remain closed and outdoor seating continues to be allowed with um, social distancing. With regard to retail, this order allows retail sales to operate up to 50% of their building occupancy, and that is also up from the prior 25%. Um, with regard to museums and libraries, um, they can also operate up to 50% of their occupancy, um, which is up from 25%, and that's provided that it's permitted by the local jurisdiction. And then um, finally, with regard to gyms and fitness centers, gyms and fitness centers may now operate up to 50% of their building capacity with appropriate distancing and cleaning. Um, there's a few other minor points contained in the, well not minor, but additional points in the order. Professional sports venues may operate and local rules prohibiting their operation are preempted. Amusement parks may submit a plan for reopening to the state. And vacation rentals, um, similarly, counties may seek approval to operate by having their county administrators submit a plan to the state Department of Business and Professional Regulations Secretary. So there is now a way forward um, for vacation rentals. And finally, um, Order 20-69, which is the order that allowed for virtual meetings, such as this one, it has been extended for the duration of Order 20-123. So those are the um, new updates from the latest governor's order, and I'll be happy to um, try to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Beck. I don't see any hands at this time, so we appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much. We're now moving to EPG discussions. The first thing on the EPG, EPG discussion agenda is the EPG meeting schedule. Um, I remember, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how often we were going to have EPG meetings. Uh, there was an agreement that we would take it through, I think, this week. Uh, through the 18th, I think the day is the 18th. Uh, so we will open it up for discussions to get your opinions and suggestions or determine uh, uh, if we're gonna continue to meet twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays, and we're gonna make a change from those uh, particular dates. So I'm gonna open it up for uh, 
a discussion from members at this time. Mayor well, Lott, you recognize. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I thought um, last time when we had a conversation with our county administrator, um, I thought it was important for us to make sure that our, 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 our three cities and our county and our school boards and, and our sheriff's department and uh, all these bodies here have our feet on the ground, taking care of those individuals that need our help the most. And, uh, um, and I, I thought it was wise for us to delay the decision until the 18th. So, uh, uh, but now looking at us working behind uh, the governor's order, which I think is the right thing to do, um, I don't see a reason for us to continue to have the Monday meeting. And uh, if, if something does come up, if, if there is an emergency, we can always uh, call a meeting just like we did when we you know, first enacted the uh, emergency uh, policy groups uh, like we did this last time. So uh, at this time, I'd like to move for us to uh, remove the Monday meeting from our schedule and to meet uh, every Thursday unless a, a situation arises where we need to have a special meeting. I'll second that. I'll second. Oh, okay. Right, we, have a, we have a motion by uh, Mayor Lott, second by uh, school board member Snively. Uh, Ms. Snively, you recognize? Uh, no, I just wanted to say uh, that I would second that motion and I support that. I think that's a wise uh, choice. So uh, once a week should be adequate unless something comes up that um, needs our attention immediately. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands at this particular point in time. So the motion is to um, have our meetings once a week. I'm sorry, Mayor Castro, recognize. Mayor Castor? Sorry, I seem to be having some problems with my hand there. Uh, I, ju I, I just I clearly go with the vote of the group, but I disagree. I think that we need to have it every two weeks because it, it really is a um, very Every fluid. two weeks? Excuse me? You said twice. every two weeks. I'm sorry, my twice. mistake. Uh, twice a week, um, you know, because it is a very fluid situation. And, and I feel that... Uh, keeping not only us informed as a group, as opposed to reading the independent uh, reports every day, and then also the consistency for the community as well. If an issue does pop up where we have to have uh, an unscheduled or unplanned meeting, clearly that communication will go out, but I believe that the citizens are, are uh, that tune in are used to having these briefings twice, uh, twice a week. And also I had, um, as I said, I had some issues with the hand uh, earlier, but I also want to get an update on the nursing home report from uh, either Chief Jones or Dr. Holt uh, when we're finished with this issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mayor, Mayor Castro, let's take up the motion to the floor and then I'll go back to to um, share. Who do you want to answer the question you said? Uh, Dr. Holt or Dr. Holt? Chief Jones. Okay, all right. Working on it. We'll Thank do that. You. We'll do that. Uh, Commissioner Overman, recognize. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I do recognize that it takes a lot for staff to get together for these meetings, and I do recognize that it's, uh, it does seem as though we have less and less on Mondays to talk about. It does also seem as though the governor seems to put out an order on Thursday or Friday that goes into effect on Mondays. Um, as it relates to that, uh, so if we don't meet again until Thursday, if something comes up that actually directly impacts our community, such as uh, sports teams things, and we, the county manages Raymond James Stadium, so we might need to know how that's going to work. Um, but more importantly, I'm trying to get a handle on what our timeline on exposure looks like. Dr. Holtz has told us where we are with nursing homes, but we've seen a lot more traffic out over the last two weeks. And I'm curious what that timeline looks like when we get to a point where a decision is made uh, by the governor that we follow along with as an emergency policy group that directly impacts the people within our community. Um, I'm, I'm just seeing that it's 10 to 14 days before we start to see the numbers creep up a little bit when we have an event or something that actually raises the exposure rates. And, uh, but we only meet, you know, if we meet just once a week, we may end up being 10 to 14 days behind the power curve. So I'm just, while, while I understand that it looks like, yes, I count votes too, that it looks like this is gonna pass, 
Uh, I'm just curious, where is the flag that says and who raises it when either a decision by the governor is made or something occurs in our community that doesn't fit on a Thursday? I, I can ask anybody that question, but I've been asking all the way along the way, when do we raise the flag that we have a spot and what does that look like? And I'll stop there. Well, Commissioner Oman, um I'll take a stab at it. And then if you don't like my answer, we'll get someone else to answer it. Um, I think the motion that was made, I don't think, I think the, well, the motion that was made by uh, Mayor Lott said that we meet starting, uh, we'll start meeting on Thursdays. And if there's an emergency that comes about that a an emergency meeting can be called of the emergency policy group. Um, and you know, we give a lot of that authority to Mr. Merrill. And Mr. Merrill does stay in constant contact with me as chairman of the policy group and as chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. So I would be one to say that if for some reason we get a spike in cases and it looks like we need to get together uh, in the consultation with Mr. Merrill, me as chair, I could be the one that would call the emergency yeah. policy group back together. Now, I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on this motion right now. I'm, I'm perplexed. Uh, but I would say that I would get with Mr. Merrill and, and be the one to call the emergency policy group emergency policy group together if there is an emergency if we do vote to have just once a week meetings. Now that's my stab at it. Anyone else want to okay. jump on that? Uh, okay. Uh Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Um thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I agree totally uh with the answer you just gave. Um I know the governor is used to issuing his orders on like Thursdays or Fridays, uh, particularly Friday morning. Um, and I think if you look at that order and there's a lot in there that affects Hillsboro, you will let us know immediately if we got to meet on Monday. And that's and that's why I understand you just said. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And the other part, the other part I left out of that is that when these orders come out, uh, I also have a lot of conversation with Beth because she gets them and she starts uh, her staff, her and her right. staff starts filtering through those things, trying to find every little nuance, every little piece of, that needs to pertaining to us. And she stays in contact with me and Mr. Merrill constantly. So that's that's true. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm willing to go with this um, to see how it goes for a short period of time. And also, I mean, I think we have to keep focused. And Mayor Lott and Miss Snively have said this over and over again. We need to deal with the emergency of, of this situation and the emergency policy group. And at some times, I think we've gone off the page a little and and uh, not and we're dealing with issues that aren't really uh, they're more like related to our particular governments or something like that. So I think um, I think this will be a, a test. Uh, so to speak, and we'll just see how it goes. But I know you'll uh, keep your finger on the pulse and keep us informed as we go along. Thank you. Do. Mr. Merrill, you recognize. Uh, yeah, maybe I can <clears throat> help answer Commissioner Overman's question. You know, I'm, I'm in constant contact with Dr. Holt uh, seven days a week. And when, when there's an issue, he calls me such as the long-term care facility. And we worked through that night and day the last three, four days to avoid a crisis that was brewing, that was affecting our hospitals. Um, and so to your question of when, when will we know, Department of Health is really the agency, the ones who can understand the data the best and and, and, and determine if there's a trend that looks like it's something we should take seriously. As I said, you know, he and I talk almost daily. He's not shy about picking up the phone and he will do that and say to me, you know, it looks like we got a problem. And I will immediately send out, you know, a message to all of, to, to all of you and the chair, I'll talk to the chair and we'll schedule a meeting. Um, so it's not like we're losing days or even hours. Um, it's been that way now for almost three months. And so I know that you don't see that part of it and nor should you, I mean, you're, you got other things to do, but you know, I, I can tell you that I and my folks 
and the hospitals are in constant discussion. And, you know, as soon as somebody notices a trend, whether it's the hospital or public health, you can be assured that I will get this body back together uh, quickly. And we can do that now with, with this technology. I don't know if that gives you any, um, gives, you, gives you the answer you're looking for, um, but that's kind of a view from the ground level here. Excellent, thank you. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Oh, sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. Okay. Uh, I don't see any further discussion on the motion. So we have a motion by Mayor Lott, a second by School Board Chair Snively. Uh, please call the roll. Miller? Yes. Overman? Yes. <clears throat> Merman? Yes. Lot? Yes. Cather? No. Roth? Yes. Pronitic? Yes. Snively? Yes. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, so we now know where we stand as far as meetings go. Uh, is there any other discussion by uh, EPG members? Um, Commissioner Overman, do you recognize? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I truly appreciate the information that we get from our medical professionals. And um, I noticed today we got an abbreviated report from Mr. Wagner, which was helpful because we've been focusing on um, uh, on our long-term care facilities and where that has been obviously a hot spot that needed attention. Uh, but as we continue to open up and as people return to work, uh, as parents are constantly trying to find daycare, which we've talked about before, uh, we're gonna see more and more people out and possibly more and more asymptomatic folks out there. So my, my question is, is it possible that we could actually get the full report that we had been previously given uh, from Mr. Wagner on Mondays, um, whether or not that's part of his presentation, an abbreviated form on Thursdays? It was really very helpful to see the spread, the age spread, and the, the percentage <laughs> of those that are in the workforce that were turning positive or positive cases. And as we see people go back to work, I think that's a very valuable information for us as EPG members, as it pertains to public health. And I'll stop there. Did you want to answer to that or, or what? Who are you addressing it to? Um, I was going to ask either Dr. Holt or Kevin Wagner. They, they provide that information or Kevin Wagner has provided the slides and the information in the past. Oh, if, if that's made possible uh, on Mondays and then we can get the abbreviated report on Thursdays, that would be helpful to me anyway. Dr. Mr. Holden, Chair, Mr. Yes. Mr. Wagner. Yes, we, Mr. we can do that. We can do that. We, we can do that. This is Mike Merrill. We, we can certainly do that. Okay. All right. Is that satisfactory to you, Commissioner Overman? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Um, Snively, recognize. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller. Uh, I want to you know, always thank everyone for the the reports that they give. It's always very informative for us, but also for for the public. Um, this this question is probably more directed towards Mr. Merrill. Um, and I, I want to thank you for um, pushing out on the Hillsborough County Government website the information about. Um, uh, the opening of parks and the opening of recreational areas. Um, many of my constituents are in constant contact with me about uh, recreational areas and facilities. And so um, do you have a plan uh, to phase in some of the things that are uh, not currently um, open and some of the organized sports, um, the, the recreational facilities that are that are still closed? Um, is that something that, that's coming? And when, when might we expect something, some information about that, please? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So we are completing a, a reopening plan for county services and county facilities. 
Uh, I expect we will have uh, something ready to go out Wednesday or Thursday this week. And what you'll see is um, something that kind of shows what's the overall plan, what are the, what are the phases, and how do we determine when we go from one phase to another. And then you'll also see for each um, service, so like for parks and recreation, there will be a separate um, slide that shows when when they're going to phase in their various functions. So like organized sports, uh, recreational programming, um, every department, every service will will show that. And, uh, you know, of course, you'll, you'll all get that. Uh, and like I say, we're targeting probably Wednesday or Thursday to get that out. Thank you very much. Appreciate that update. Look forward to seeing that um, that phasing that phased in planning. Thanks. Commissioner Overman, you recognize. Commissioner Overman, you recognize. Sorry. I'm sorry that I forgot to take my hand down. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to have a discussion on any topic today? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. This is Augustine Grove yes. of the Clerk's Office. I just need to announce the uh, vote count on that previous motion. That motion carried seven to one with Mayor Castor voting no. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see Mayor Castor recognized. Mayor Castor? Um, yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to during Dr. Holt's uh, presentation about. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you ask either Chief Jones or uh, Dr. Holt to talk about the nursing home task force and what who that's comprised of and exactly what they have done uh, to date. Just the additional information that um, that Dr. Holt uh, didn't share. I think that would be good for the entire group. Dr. Holt, or Chief Jones, you all hear uh, Mayor Cashman's question? Um, I'd be happy to start, but certainly welcome to uh, Chief Jones. Uh, he and Chief Lewis Cicero have been integral parts of this uh, group. Um, the group is comprised of Florida Department of Health representatives, my team, ACA team, uh, which includes regional uh, uh, staff, but also, as I mentioned, I think previously, at least two out of the three times that we've had an, um, a cause, and they're, they're happen twice a week, uh, Secretary Mayhew has been involved. So it's it's got full leadership. Uh, Mr. Merrill, Gene Early are also comprised, uh, in addition to Chief Jones and Chief Los Cicero. Um, the hospitals, uh, there's representatives of each of the four systems um, that, that also participate in that. Um, to date, the uh, efforts have been developing, uh, and, and this is not in order, uh, a testing plan that uh, really led by Mr. Early and would allow us to offer testing in advance of the state uh, scheduled teams locally so we can provide testing at um, uh, all of the long-term care facility staff and any residents they approve to do. Uh, this is gonna be in partnership with Adventist Health and, and uh, many of our um, community uh, partners. The other thing we've done is we've streamlined the process whereby uh, long-term care facilities can effectively and appropriately transfer patients that they identify that are positive um, through a single um, call-in line uh, at the emergency operations center. The uh, uh, site visits, the, the follow-up contacts that um, that, that is, as you and uh, recall, we started back in first in March. Uh, that has been led by again Chief Jones. Uh, if he's on, I'll defer to him. But my understanding is last update was that nearly all of them have been recontacted a second time. Um, the additional coordination of uh, an alternate care that's probably not the right term. It's a step down that is a bridge between the 
hospitals that received um, a, a, po a positive person, many of them are not medically necessary to be transferred from the long-term care facility, but they need very close monitoring as soon as they are detected to ensure that they do not uh, decompensate, uh, but also allows the facility to assess the extent of the uh, COVID-19 that they have in their facility. Uh, um, the patients as of now have to remain in a hospital setting until they have a clearance test, two negative clearance tests over 48 hours or so separated by 24 hours. Uh, this can result in a hospital stay that, that is not uncommonly over uh, three plus or four, even as long as six weeks of people who are present that really do not need the medical care and are actually much better served and more comfortable in a long-term care facility where they could be um, cohorted even and um, uh, some liberalization of the social distancing restrictions they've had as they are uh, collectively positive and can't reinfect each other. Uh, I know there's much more I'm not including. Uh, we do review all of our uh, active uh, cases so every, for each facility, so the hospitals and the whole system are aware of anything that we are involved in. Um, I'll step there and offer Chief Jones or Chief LeCicero, whoever on the call, if they would like to, to also make some comments. Chief Jones. Uh, thank, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, in addition to what Dr. Holt shared, we have had this task force uh, put together. It involves all the agencies that were mentioned, including county administration and fire rescue. Uh, when the pandemic began, the local fire rescue agencies visited all 294 um, adult care facilities. Um, we have now in the last week done that one more time. We've shared information with the staff, uh, visited to make sure that they understood the safety precautions that need to be uh, taken and left uh, a packet behind to assist them in taking care of the patients. One of the important things that we're trying to do is balance the distribution of patients among the many hospitals in the facility uh, in, the, in the vicinity of Hillsborough County. And uh, that single point of contact that uh, Dr. Holt mentioned uh, is a staff officer with the fire rescue uh, agency that makes sure that we distribute, even if it's the two and three at a time uh, or 15 to 50, uh, that we get those patients equally distributed so no hospital is overloaded. Uh, to, this, to this point, we have already um, gone in and tested all of the staff in 34 of the facilities, there are about 290 in the county, uh, and we have um, we're supporting the regional incident management team that's working in this uh, West Coast region, uh, trying to supplement what they're doing, and uh, in partnership with Advent Health, primarily uh, going to the facilities and doing the testing there. So uh, we're also we also are supporting the hospitals, and uh, as Dr. Holt mentioned getting these patients out of the hospitals to make room for additional uh, new patients where we're moving those patients and distributing them to support the, the hospital system as well. And I'll stop there if there's any questions. Mayor Castor, that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. The only uh, question I have is how long, what's the turnaround on uh, those tests when, when you take them? Are they the instant read or is that a five to seven day turnaround? They, they are not the instant read. Uh, they go to the labs and they have the normal wait period that uh, the PCR tests uh, have been having. Okay, thanks. And the only other uh, just quick question I have, Chair, because I've heard two different, I know I went on and filled out the survey on, on the uh, county website when it first came out. And then I thought I heard that it had ended, but then I heard someone else say that it's continuing on and so all of that's being mapped in the surveillance system as well. So maybe uh, Mr. Merrill knows the answer to that. Is the survey still on the Hillsborough County uh, website that asks about the symptoms and so forth? And if so, is that mapped into the syndromic surveillance system? 
Mr. Um, Barrow, do you have a question? I'm not sure I have the answer. Uh, Leanna, are you on the phone by chance or on the line? I don't see her. Okay. That's I'll, okay. Uh, I can talk. I'll, I'll find out later. That's fine. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll That's you it know. for me. Okay. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a lot of the big attractions are getting ready to open. Um, I think June 1st, um, well, some of them have already the aquarium. And I've gotten a lot of questions about are we, are there any particular requirements uh, from our county, um, what they need to have in place as far as safety guidelines, all that. Is there somebody, and I'll ask Dr. Holt this, because I think it's probably in his wheelhouse or maybe Mr. Merrill, who can these people contact to make sure that they're taking all the necessary precautions? Well, I can start. Um, so I've had discussions with four of the major facilities who contacted me to share their plans. Um, they, all of them have um, engaged either Department of Health or um, some other, some other uh, uh, public health group to help them uh, come up with their plans for reopening. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, I, I've been really impressed with, so the zoo, the aquarium, you know, Mosey uh, and others, um, because we don't, we, the local governments don't regulate that, but they have voluntarily, they have voluntarily come to me anyway and said, you know, here's what we're doing. What do you think? How does that compare to what the county's doing? But I've been very impressed with, on their own, they've gone out and engaged medical, public health experts, others to help them uh, kind of deal with the logistics of getting people safely through the venues. Um, so that's that's been kind of the process so far. So should they submit a plan to you or to someone, or is there someone they should call to get engaged? It's not one of those four. Um, it's a couple smaller, uh, but significant yeah. attractions. Yeah, they, they can. Um, and what I'll do then is um, have our facilities team, our task force that's been put together to look at our facilities. And mm -hmm. I'll have our, our health care advisors, public health advisors at USF School of Public Health engage with them so that way They'll, they'll have some people that's helping to support them. Okay. I think everybody just wants safety is the big concern and they want to do it right. Um, they don't want to have any, they don't want, they want to take as least risk as possible because, you know, right. whenever you let people in, that's when the risk starts. So um, that's, that's a question. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Sure. Okay, I don't see any other hands for any discussion. Am I correct? Yes. So if that's it for the discussion, we have our next meeting on this coming Thursday, the 21st at 1.30. And if there's no further discussion by this body, we're adjourned. Have a great day. Have a good one. Thank you. That's what he said. Thank you.